What's up, BBN? Welcome into another episode of Believe in Kentucky. My name is Vinny Hardy. Y'all can get this episode right off the site. Go to Believe.com, wherever you get your podcast, Spotify, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts. Be sure to follow the show at Believe in Kentucky on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, all your social media. Follow me at Vinny Hardy, Vinny with a Y, Hardy with a Y. Got a fun episode today. We got a former player coming to us from the West Coast, repping that school, the only school that's got more national championships than us. I'm talking about a former UCLA Bruin. This is this this is kind of treasonous stuff we're doing on Believe in Kentucky today. We're bringing in former UCLA, UCLA Bruin, Travis Reed. Man, Travis, welcome to Believe in Kentucky. He hosts Believe in UCLA. First of all, let me get the intro in. Uh, and he got another podcast as well. We talk about all of that. But welcome into Believe in Kentucky, Travis, man. How you doing? Good, good. Thank you. Because we are the, uh, you know, most national championships in basketball, college history. Uh, the most in a row with seven. And we have the two greatest college basketball players ever with Lou Alcindor and Bill Walton. Man, that's look, and, and as bad as I want to argue that I can't, I can't refute any of that. You know, <laughs> that one y'all had was was something else. Speaking of that, have you know you've been a former player? Did you have some interactions with Coach Wooden and Cap and Walton? Did you get to meet them when they came around and and chop it up with them and during your playing days there? Yeah, well, you know, I didn't talk to, uh, you know, Miss, you know, Kareem, you know, uh, Mr. Mr. Jabbar. I don't, I can't call him Kareem. I got to call him, you know, give him out of respect. He's Mr. Jabbar to me, always will be. Uh, I talked to, you know, uh, Mr. Wooden as well. You know, uh, he used to come to our practices, see how we were. Um, you know, he would talk to us like, you know, he was just like, like a basketball savant when it comes to like books and knowledge, and, you know. Uh, he, he had, he didn't really, I don't remember him, I don't even remember him having a TV. I remember him having like thousands and thousands of books at his house. And uh, that's really all he had, especially after his wife passed. So he just read a lot of books and just, you know, he was so smart and knowledgeable to the very end, you know, until he passed. And, uh, you know, it was such an honor to meet him. And Mr. Al, you know, I met Mr. Walton too. He was doing our games. He was a commentator. So like he still commentates on games, mm-hmm. and so for me, I I have a great deal of respect for all three of those men because um, you know they're all legends in their own right, and I was such as like a great honor to to share the court that they actually played on. You know? Yeah, because I mean, you know, we talk about blue bloods. There's been a lot of you know, different debates, blue bloods, this and that. But for you to be out there, you, you, they got just as much tradition as anybody. And like you said, you played on that court where they played. So that's 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 heavy stuff, man. That's deep stuff. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. For me, like I said, I, when I was there, I came in there with Baron Davis, Earl Watson, Billy Knight, got rest his soul, Rico Hines. Uh, we were the number one recruiting class in the country uh, when I was there. Uh, back in 98, and then 99 came in Jerome Weasio, Dan Gadzirik, Jerron Rush, Matt Barnes, uh, <laughs> Ray Young. So they were the number one recruiting class in the country the next year. And funny thing about that, funny story about that is Matt wasn't the main guy. You know, it wasn't Matt. Uh, Matt was like an afterthought compared to the other four, to be honest. The other four were all McDonald's All-Americans. You know, Jerron was, Dan was, uh, Ray was, and, uh, you know, Jerome was a top 10 player in the country from France. So, um, yeah, like Matt was like an afterthought, but obviously he had the longest career, and obviously he's into the his own podcast himself. So, yeah, um, yeah like I said, on that team, it was probably the most talented team. Uh, I've been on that not win anything because we basically had eight professionals on the team, mm-hmm. five NBA guys and three overseas guys yeah. and myself. So, you know, and, and, and they basically was, you know, three first round picks, two second round picks and me, you know, me, Billy and Ray all played overseas multiple years. Yeah. yeah. Now you born and raised in LA, been part of that recruiting class coming in. Was there, 
ever a, a, a thought that you were going anywhere but UCLA or where do you always want to stay in LA or is, who were some of the other uh, schools that recruited you and did you want to did you think about going away from home or do you want to stay in the city how did that play out for you oh no look I mean I had committed to Arizona okay because uh, when I was getting recruited by UCLA Jim Herrick was the coach and then he had the scandal you know like with the with the like using the company company credit card or whatever the case is on the dinner Yo. and he got fired you know and he got fired. And then, like, I was like, well, there goes that. So <laughs> I ain't going to East LA now. Um, and I committed to Arizona and Long Beach. And, and, and side, another side note was I ended up transferring to Long Beach State. That was another school that was recruiting me uh, heavy. It was like Arizona, UCLA, or UCLA, Arizona, Long Beach State, Syracuse, mm. and Tennessee. They were like my top five schools. Um, you know, coming up, and uh, if five A was like, you know, uh, you know, SC was in there too, but they were six. Oh. Um, but yeah, like I, I went on recruiting trips to Arizona, UCLA, and uh, Long Beach State, and I almost went to Long Beach State. Uh, but then I was like, I thought to myself, like all my friends are going to like UCLA, Duke. You know, Kentucky, can whatever, you know, uh, USC. So I was like, I'm just as good as them. Why can't I go to UCLA? And what happened was after I committed to Arizona, um, Coach Lavin, Steve Lavin at the time was like, Trap, you know, we want you. We want you. You know, we want you to come to UCLA. Uh, we still think you're a great player. Um, I believe in you. And so, like, when that happens, you know, with school to your dreams, there is no choice over that you know yeah it just you know so just, i was one of the you know top 40 players in the country at the time and so was a bunch of schools recruiting me but ucla was always my dream school mm -hmm. and so once once you hear that man it's just it's a wrap <laughs> thank you arizona thank you long beach state you know <laughs> but ucla is my school right right that's all right yeah. um, now i didn't finish but i started there i didn't finish but i started there. <laughs> uh, uh, so, and then when you transferred, it was Long Beach, which was which was second, right? They were your second choice or third? Yeah, like they were like, yeah, they were third. They were third. You know what I'm saying? They were third. It was like UCLA, Arizona, Long Beach State. You know, but it was like kind of like all neck and neck. It was like really close finish. Because I really, I really was thinking about going to Long Beach State at high school. Right. Had there been a transfer portal, would you have still went to Long Beach State? If you know, if that had been in effect back then, would you have maybe? Oh, I would have. I probably would have. Yeah, look, I would have probably. Yeah, I, I probably still would have because I felt like with uh, UCLA. Um, now the NIL, it would have been depending on how much the NIL money I was getting UCLA. I might have stuck it out if I was getting a hundred grand a year because UCLA is a big time school getting a hundred grand a year how can you you know it's hard to be like oh nah i'm gonna turn, I'm, I'm gonna just you know take this 50 grand instead of this hundred grand yeah i might have stayed but like transfer portal like I, I finished out my freshman year really strong which had me really anticipate my sophomore year um man matter of fact we my in my freshman year we played kentucky in the sweet 16. Uh, when they had Scott Pageant, uh, not you know Nazi Muhammad, you know Jamal McGlure, the year they won the national championship, mm -hmm. the '98. That's right. Um, Tubby Smith's first year when he oh. had all Rick Pitino's talent, and um, you know, like I actually, you know, was like, yeah, I'm a sophomore, year, I'm, I'm going, you know, I'm, I'm coming in ready, and things started out really well, and then. You know, like the coach kind of started, you know, playing other players because of the name, quote unquote, instead of like the game, because they had the big names. And so I was like, you know, I just want to go play where I know I'm going to play and just have fun. Like, I just want to play ball. You know, I actually thought about quitting basketball after my sophomore year, but I ended up not doing it. I went on a couple of recruiting trips. I went to Oklahoma when they had Kelvin Sampson. Um, I went to Long Beach State again, and I went to Tennessee again. And I thought to myself, like, 
I can't go to, you know, Tennessee's too far. Oklahoma's kind of far. My grandma was sick at the time, and I was like, I just need to stay close to her, so I ended up going to Long Beach State. Right, right. Yeah, so, yeah, the that 98 team, you know, it's the kind of people, people, Kentucky fans kind of forget about it because you, you had 96. You mentioned the UCLA team you were on with all those pros. Same thing with 96, you know, uh, Delk Mercer, Antoine Walker, Mark Pope, you know, all those guys with Walter McCarty that went to the league. Um, and then Tubby comes in, you know, all those guys are gone. You know, it's it's Jeff Shepard, it's, it's Scott Padgett, it's Cameron Mills, it's Wayne Turner, and, you know, Najee Muhammad. So, you know, for Tubby to, to kind of get that team to the, to the title, I mean, it's people want to say, well, it was Rick's players, but – you know, Rick was in Boston and all those other guys were in the league and it was kind of, I mean, they were there, but they were kind of looked at as the leftovers <laughs> for when you look at 96 <laughs> and 97, you know, and, um, but they still. You figure that three-year run, they went to the national championship game for three straight years. I mean, they lost to Arizona in 97 in the final where they should have probably won. Oh, man. Uh, yes, yes. You know, like I said, he went. People forget that, like Kentucky, he had it rolling for a minute, and like I said, they went to the you know national championship three straight years in a row. Yo, yo, and you know, you know, Derek Anderson doesn't play. That's and you know he didn't play in the championship game. You know, Muhammad misses those free throws. It was it was right there, man. It was right there. Yeah, um, like I said, it, <laughs> and I thought that Derek Anderson was probably one of the most athletic guards in the in the country at that time. He was. I remember that team. Cause he was windmilling and dunking and doing all that stuff. And, you know, I just felt like um, you guys probably should have won 97. And then you went, you go back and win it in 98, yeah. you know, so you could have had a three in a row kind of thing, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, so growing up on the West coast, I mean, I ain't going to say what we said off the air, but you, you are aware of Kentucky. you, UCLA got the tradition and history, but you are up on Kentucky's history and tradition and, and got a lot of respect from Kentucky from even though you're 3,000 miles away. Well, definitely got a lot of respect for Kentucky. Uh, one of my childhood friends, Tayshawn Prince, obviously went to Kentucky. Uh, you know, um, I've, all, I've watched Kentucky for a long time, probably since, since uh, Bertino was there, you know, back in 92. When they when y'all should have beat Duke, or when you know Duke had the Christian Leighton shot that's replayed over and over and over again, uh, uh, he's you know what I'm saying? People, so stomping on people and getting to stay in the game, but we ain't gonna, we're yeah, exactly stomping on people's <laughs> chest and you know, you know, you know how that go, man. So if that would have been like I said, that would have been Shaq. He'd have been thrown out for two years, yeah. you know. <laughs> you know, so I, I, uh, it was. I watched Kentucky for a long time. It was actually one of my schools I would have went to if they were recruiting me hard. You know, like say UCLA did recruit me. If they Kentucky did, I, I probably would have went to Kentucky. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, and so like I, I've always had a great, great deal of respect for Kentucky. So you were six eight. You played some forward, played some center. Were you a? Uh, uh, prototypical tweener where you would you describe yourself as a tweener or were you more of a four or how would you have come I would say uh yeah I was probably a four I was four but like I was a tweener like if I was in today's NBA it would be it'd be nothing you know like I would I'd be playing because today's NBA that's it's pretty much what it is nothing but tweenish (laughs) but when I played like you know everybody wanted a quote-unquote seven-foot center a 6'10", uh, power forward, a 6'8", small forward, you know, like a so on and so forth. Uh-huh. And, uh, you know, it wasn't – when I was playing, it wasn't necessarily about the skills. It was more about, like, status quo. Um, I can give you a funny story, real quick story, that I was in Poland my first year, and I got cut from the team not because of anything but because of my height. Because? They were looking for a 6'10", 6'11". Uh-huh. Yeah. Like they was looking for a six ten, six eleven guy, and I was like, I'm six eight, but I got you know I, I can play, man. You know, like they was like, well, we're looking for a six eleven guy. Like literally, it was just like that, and they cut me. Man. And so you know, I was like, okay, all right, but yeah, 
I think now into now's the NBA day, like now's game, I, I could play easily, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because positionless wasn't a thing twenty years ago, twenty five years ago. Like it was no everybody's no, roles were clearly wasn't. defined. Like <laughs> Yes, exactly. And and that's how it was. Like really like everybody was like centers, seven foot, six ten power forward, six eight small forward, you know, like just like that. Mm-hmm. Cause I remember we there was this little this Christmas tournament, you know, everybody has the high school tournaments, uh, you know, holiday tournaments, and we were in Myrtle Beach, and Raymond Felton's high school out of South Carolina was playing against DeMatha, and everybody on, uh, it was Ladder High School is where he went to in South Carolina. Everybody on Felton's team, 6'2", 6'3", 6'4", they all about the same height. And of course, the math is just like you said: seven foot center, six ten power forward, six six three, you know, six five two guard, six three point guard. They look like an NBA team warming up. And Felton and them drilled them, and you it would look like David versus Goliath <laughs> warm up line. <laughs> but Felton, they went out there and blasted the math, and nobody, you know, you just look at it on paper, quote unquote, or whatever. There's no way that could happen. But you know it, it did. It, but you know it was this was two thousand two thousand one. You know whenever Felton was coming out before, his junior year before he went to North Carolina. But the math that looked just like your your model NBA squad. <laughs> yep, and, and I always said like you know like for me like that don't necessarily like you know like that don't mean like wins. It's always weird because like any anybody who's like knows basketball like it's a it should be a position this game where like anybody can play every anywhere no. you know and so like it was never that it was always like you know when i was playing it was that like but now it's it's it, the game has evolved uh to what it is now it's more about skill you know when i in europe it's more about uh some places about that tradition you know uh so like in europe i never played center i played like forward you know, mm-hmm. um, but like their game is so like fluent. It's not like one on one. You know, it's not like a pick and roll. It's just more like pass, move, pass, move, pivot. You know that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. A lot of shooting. I mean, they slow the game down. It's really a lot of physicality. You know, so um, yeah, like I said, the game is different than it was now. But you know, like I, I appreciate both my time and and now. That's good too. That it's not like you're the old man that's hating on what's happening now. You can you can appreciate both. That's that's. I can way. appreciate it. Like, do, do I like teams shooting fifty five threes or whatever? No, I'm not gonna lie about that. You know, like I like they're like I like people who can go in the post and play in the post too. You know, example like uh, Giannis or Anthony Davis. You know, uh, they uh, LeBron. They can go into the post, make post moves. And still score that way rather than like, you know, I don't know, Steph Curry. Like I, I respect Steph Curry's game or, you know, you know, like Steph Curry, you know, like or uh, James Harden shooting threes and falling down, hopefully the ref bail him out. I don't like yeah. bailout stuff. Like, right. you know, make make a bucket. You know, if we was playing pickup, you're not going to get no ref to call, you know, that. So make it make make shots, period. You know, exactly. We got to get to your, you know, your professional career. We talk about, of course, this year's Bruins and, and this year's Cats. We get to that too. But when you finished up at Long Beach State, and you were kind of looking at your options and you were looking at overseas, just what, what, what were your options? How did you approach it? As like, what am I going to do next? Now I'm, I'm done playing college. What was your, what was you like? What's my next move going to be? Well, pretty much my next, I felt like my next move was going to be like, so I wanted to play, you know, um, I wanted to play somewhere. I wanted to continue to play ball. So like my boy had just played in the G league at the, yeah, in the, in the G league or the, it was a D league then, whatever it was in the D league then yeah. it's G league now. Yeah. yeah. My boy, had just got finished playing in the D league. He basically told me like, yo, if you want to play in like some small, small city like Willacoochee, Georgia, no, nothing against that, but like, you know, or Albuquerque, New Mexico, you stand in the two bedroom spot with five dudes. 
go ahead and you know play in the you know play in the D League, you know, and then you don't make no money because then it was making like twenty five hundred a month. Hmm. You know, now they're making like seven, eight thousand or whatever it was, whatever it is. But like, yeah, then it was they was making twenty five hundred a month or twenty two hundred a month. Wow. So I was like, man, like that ain't no money, bro. And I'm gonna have to spend all this time on a two bedroom on a bus. <laughs> I'm cool. And then like they offering the how much they offering, you know, a hundred thousand overseas or whatever. Mm. So I was like, okay. So I played my senior year, was all big West first team, whatever, runner up play the year. Then I went to uh, ESPN sports center showcase camp in Virginia. Uh, I won AVP, uh, led the, led the, you know, led, led the camp at school and all that. And then, uh, there was, but like the best thing that happened for me on that camp where there was NBA scouts, but there also was overseas scouts, you know, at, at, the, at the same camp. So I remember like a couple of overseas scouts hit me up for, uh, you know, like the playing their leagues, uh, Germany, Holland, Australia, a couple other places. And I was like, that ain't enough money. So I, I kind of left that to the side, you know? And then I was like, okay, well, I'm going to go, I need money right away, right now. And I went to Bogota, Colombia. That was my first place. I went to Bogota, Colombia, where I make like $5,000 a month. I was like, I can't beat that. So I went over there for about two months, made the 10000 and left, signed a contract, going to Poland over there. And was like, you know, this is great. I'm happy. And, and after that, uh, you know, you know, going to Poland, like I, I guess, like for me, like I wanted to play in the NBA, so you know, we can rewind that. But I wanted to play in the NBA, but I just didn't want to, like, give you know, miss out on this money, you know, like to the, mm. the, 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 the take a chance on the NBA. I didn't want to risk, you know, having a hundred thousand dollar job or a five thousand dollar month job, and just be like, all right, I'm gonna go try in this NBA thing, but I don't know for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I went to Poland, and I we already talked about this story where I was cut because I was it wasn't six ten. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that was kind of like my first real like face to face of like dealing with adversity, mm-hmm. for nothing in Europe, and that's how they do it. And so I went to Poland. I mean, Poland. I went to uh, Belgium after that, or France rather, France. The coach got fired, and then the new coach came in, didn't want me, he wanted his own guys. Wow. Yeah, so I was stuck in France. Uh, I remember like it was yesterday. Like, I was in France about to fly home. And my agent calls me. Like, he does an emergency call to the airport. It was like, man, you know, like, uh, I get a call, like, you know, Paige and Travis Reed or whatever. Like, I'm about, about to board the flight. You know, like, I'm about to board the flight. And he was like, don't get on the plane. I got another job for you in Belgium. I'll be there in three days. Just get a hotel. So I was like, I got a hotel for like three days turned to seven days, seven days turned to 10 days. So I'm in a hotel for 10 days, uh, chilling, (laughs) eating McDonald's every day. So from from here, like from there, I didn't eat McDonald's for like, Five years straight after that, I really don't eat McDonald's now, but I didn't. I didn't touch it for five years. <laughs> Had enough. <laughs> yeah, because I I ate it every day for like ten days straight, and so um, he finally comes. We go to Bel- uh, Poland, Belgium. I'm sorry, and the coach likes me, but doesn't like me as much as I, you know, like he likes his other player. So they release me, oh. and so by the end, I fire my agent because I'm like, dude, I'm through with you. <laughs> You know, I'm through with you, man. Like you, all these trials, no, no job. So the agent from the the camp I went to hits me back. You know, it was like, look, you can come to Holland. It's not a lot of money. You know, you start out making two thousand dollars a month or fifteen hundred dollars a month. I was like, at this point, man, I'll take it. You know, man. you know. So I remember my first game with that team. We played the eventual champion of the league. Um. They blow us out by 30. Now, I scored 30 points, but they blow us out by 30. So I'm thanking the coach, thanking for the opportunity. You know, I just I give me a ticket home. He was like, a ticket home? Travis, going to keep you. I said, what? 
oh, okay, thank you, you know? And that's how my career in Holland, you know, started. That's how my basketball career started. Man, so it was, you stuck in a hotel from France to Belgium to Holland, and in Holland, you for a minute, you're making less than D-League money. Yep, yep, <laughs> yeah, no, and that whole, that whole season, like, you figure, like, I, my first Poland was good, but, like, I didn't even get no money from it because they cut me from because mm-hmm. not being 16. From Poland to France to Belgium to Holland, all in the same, you know, same, like, two-month span. And, mm-hmm. you know, in, and I would say I went to Bogota before then, you know? Right. right. You know, so I was already been around, been around the world <laughs> just in my first year. So being from L.A., I mean, Bogota is a huge city, but and then going from South America to, to Europe, which which places did you like better? Or how are you adjusting to all these different places so fast? Just I mean, uh, you got to go with the flow I get to make it. But how did you handle all that? Well, I would say this. My girlfriend at the time got me a map. Got me a map. And I was looking like, where am I going? <laughs> Warsaw, Poland. Okay. It was like, damn, I'm, I'm, ooh, I'm way over here in Warsaw. And then I, <laughs> then I was like, okay, where am I going now? France? Okay. Oh, you know, like kind of like that. Like I had to look on the map because I, be honest, like I, I knew of these countries, obviously, but I never been there. Yeah. So, you know, this is like a culture shock. Mm-hmm. You know, Everything is a culture shock. Nobody really speaks English. I remember like, uh, you ever saw the movie Love and Basketball? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, remember when they was talking in Italian and she wasn't listening? She was tying her shoes up because they wasn't speaking English. Yeah, that's how Bogota, Colombia was. The coach didn't speak English. He would talk for fifteen minutes. I would ask the dude, my teammate, what he say. He was like, "Get the ball to you inside." <laughs> and he talked for fifteen minutes. He was like, he was like, more or less. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay, all right, <laughs> whatever. That's crazy. You know, crazy. Oh, hey. That's what I said. So. I, you know, I saw, you know, like the world and just, I, you know, like in a different fashion, so young, I didn't appreciate it because like I said, I went to Warsaw, Poland and then France and I stayed, you know, I, I, I played there, you know, tried out with the team. They didn't want me because the coach got fired the 10 days of just being there. Uh, and then after that, um, you know, like going to Belgium, then Holland, you know, like I said, playing for nothing because I, at that time I was like, well, you know, I told my pops, I was like, I need to come back home. And he was like, what you going to do? Uh-huh. You going to be a teacher? You going to be, what are you going to do? You know, like, if you have a plan to do something, son, come back home. If you don't have a plan, stay your butt out there. <laughs> right. Mm-hmm. He was just, you know, point blank, like, stay your butt out there if you don't have a plan. Yeah. So I stayed. And like I said, it was a blessing because I finally got on. And, you know, like, it, and I played in Holland for four years, won a championship, won it. Two MVPs, uh, you know, was you know best big man of the year, you know, four years in a row. So like, yeah, like you know, uh, it was like a blessing, man. It was such a blessing to kind of stick it out through the through the storm, you know. So for the let's see, from hands of ass capitals, Dutch basketball. Yeah, yeah. It, back then, league. that's that's the that's the sponsor. But like when I was there, it was NPC Capitals. Oh, okay. Okay. That was the main sponsor, yeah. yeah. All star game MVP, MVP, All Star. Did it just did it just click for you? I mean, you it's, it's basketball. I, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. It's basketball. It's basketball. But every league is different. It's different around different parts of the world. But what what clicked to where you just went over there and and just put in work and and just was the best player in the league, the MVP, All Star. What 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 clicked over there for that period? Just getting an opportunity, man. Be honest, just getting an opportunity. I, you know, like for me, it was a situation where, you know, like I felt like I knew I had game. I knew I could play, you know. Um, I knew I could play, but I just felt like I didn't get out. Like in a lot of places, like, you know, like example, like UCLA, I knew I could play. I just didn't get an opportunity, you know, like and get, it got the confidence to play. Like to go out there and play my game, you know, and that's why one of the reasons why I left UCLA. Um, when I went to Long Beach State, I was all Big West first team two years in a row. So I, it was more of confirmation, like I can play. 
Uh-huh. Um, and they, you know, and I felt the same way when I went overseas my first year. Uh, I was out there like I'm a kill, you know, and like I didn't get that right opportunity. And then once I got the right opportunity, where the coaches kind of let me play, you know, I I knew I could play. So I just it was just basically just the right opportunity, and just you know having to, you know being blessed to you know play. Yeah. Um, because like for me it was like you know like just give me the, just let me play, just give me the opportunity. I could you know I could show you what I can do, you know. And it's it's crazy. I you know I had a few little questions I wrote down and you know reading up, and you know all your time overseas, <laughs> I had written down like a loving basketball question. I marked it out. I was like, man, he gonna think that's cheesy. I ain't gonna ask him about loving basketball. And then you mentioned it, <laughs> bro, bro. Let me tell you something, man. Like that was my life. You know what I'm saying? That what you saw with her. That was my life. You right. know, like. You know, like I had to, like I had to put it in my contract where I had internet, like high end internet, hmm. and I had to have cable where American shows was on. You know, mm-hmm. um, because right. like you know, like in Bogota, it was all Spanish. It was just like that, but all Spanish. You know what I'm saying? And so, like for me, I was just like, bro, like you know, like you have to learn to adjust your life and your mindset. You know. Hmm. Um, uh, and you know, like, unless you have a routine, you you won't make it. You will not make it. It was so many guys that played two, three, four years at the most, and they couldn't take it. They couldn't take being away from their friends. They couldn't take it being away from their family. Mm-hmm. They was like, you know, I'm not. I can't do it. You know. Yeah. And I'm just like, bro. This is money, this is business, you know, this is my life right now. So I'm gonna figure out what I gotta do. So mm-hmm. I would get up in the morning, I would go to the, you know, gym, go work out, lift, uh, you know, come back home, you know, eat lunch, take a nap, you know, get up, we ready to go for practice, you know, mm-hmm. for that night. Yeah. Go to sleep, get up, go shoot, you know, <laughs> mm-hmm. come back home, eat a nap, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, go to practice, you know. So like I had my routine going. You know, and so that's what kept me going. And it's basically self discipline, right? You had to you had to keep yourself disciplined. No nobody else was over there. You had to keep yourself, I guess, motivated, keep yourself locked in on your routine to keep doing that day in and day out. I guess it's, that was on just you. Yeah, you know, no, it's definitely just you. And like you know, people wonder like, you know, like certain things where like I tell people, I, I they ask me how did I stay out there for so long? I tell them like, man, it, me and God got real close uh, because it's, it's basically you and him. Like some people bring their families and things like that. So it's a little bit more easy to bring their girl, their girlfriend come live. Yeah. But my girl at the time, she didn't want to do that. Uh-huh. She didn't want to just not make any money and not, you know, she didn't want to do that. So we we did the long this the long distance thing <laughs> for real wow. for a couple of years, but like it just after a while it just got you know too overwhelming for the both of us, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And so like we was like let's just go, both kind of go separate ways, and if we come back, we come back, you know. But like mm-hmm. you know, uh, it was you have to kind of think. I, I thought about it like this is the world I'm in. The states is another world. I think about that world when I get back to that world. Hmm. You know, had to this is my world. Yeah, the yeah. compartmentalized. Wow, you got to. Like I said, this, this is, I'm not saying it. You know, like everybody got to do that, but like this is what I did to last as long as I did. Hmm. This, this is where, I, this is where I was at. I, when I was in Holland for those four years, Holland was my world during that time. You know, until I went home, and then I deep. You know, don't think about Holland <laughs> at all. <laughs> Right. You know, and then, you know, once it's like th- two weeks or a week when I signed that contract, it's okay, time to think about Holland again, mm-hmm. you know, or time to think about Estonia or, or Ukraine or wherever I was there going. Yeah. So you talked about, I mean, you've been real about, you know, by yourself, the language, you know, adversity is what's the, what's the best part? Is it the money? What's the best part about being over there in that world? You're getting to play. Uh, what's what's the high points, the the most positive thing? Because it's 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 an adjustment 
it's tough. I guess even when it's going good, it's tough because you're around the world and and but you know what's what's the best part? I guess that kind of made it all worth it. The people, hmm. the people. Like don't, don't get me wrong, look, I'm not gonna pay for free. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> the money was a great plus, a great right. plus. Uh, especially when you start making real money, you know, like when you start making real money and you start depositing that money to your bank account, you're like, Oh Lord, yes, what I'm playing for. Uh, so I can take a coach yelling at me. I don't care. Like as long as my money come to be straight, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Uh, but the people like playing the game, you know, like the camaraderie of the team, that's small stuff, you know, like, uh, that made it fun to, for me, you know what I'm saying? For me. Like, I have fun uh, because, you know, like, I love the people that I was playing for, you know. Like, the fans are going crazy, screaming your name. You know, you, you get a dunk and then you holler and everybody, the crowd goes crazy. And, yeah. You know, at one point, like, when we won the championship, it was the first championship they had won in, I don't know, like, 15 years on that team. So, like, when I was in Holland my second year, and like the fans, like they went crazy, you know. They pick you up on the shoulders, on the shoulders. You, you're like waving, like you know. They pick like you the pope or something, man. It's crazy. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like I ain't never been like picked up on nobody's shoulder. Fans pick me up my six eight butt on their shoulders. Yeah. And like ah yeah, so I'm like screaming to the crowd and pumping them up. It's, it was crazy. Like I said, it was crazy. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. Got to hit one sponsor real quick. I know you know about it because you do believe in UCLA. So we, we got <laughs> uh, NordVPN. What's more important than peace of mind? Nothing. And that's what NordVPN is here for, to give you peace of mind while you are online. With all the threats that you face today on the internet, it is more important than ever to be sure that you have the best VPN you can get. NordVPN is the world's best VPN service, offering the fastest connectivity, most servers, and next-gen encryption to make sure that everything you do online stays secure. Plus, you can use NordVPN on all your computers and devices, no matter the operating system. With NordVPN's unlimited bandwidth, you never have to worry about a slow connection either, and plans start at under $4 per month. So grab your exclusive NordVPN deal by going to nordvpn.com slash believe or use the code believe that's b-l-e-a-v to get up to 70 percent off your nordvpn plan plus one additional month for free it's also risk-free with nord's 30-day money-back guarantee so always good stuff and good protection from nordvpn we appreciate them sponsoring believe in kentucky as well as believe in ucla with travis reed and sam conning y'all can check them out uh, dropping new episodes each week too, man. Um, speaking of, you know, you did the episodes you guys do, you and Sam. What are y'all's thoughts? You know, first of all, as a former player, take let's go back to last year when y'all got hot and we made the play in and went all the way to the Final Four. What was your thoughts watching that run, man? It was magical, man. Because like I would say this, like they started out really hot last year. Like eight and one, seven and seven and two, something like that. And then they kind of like muddled through the rest of the season. And they lost like their last six, seven in a row, whatever it was. And like I said, they played Michigan State. I was like, great. I guess that's the first great play in game. We played Michigan State. And so I was like, okay, well, you know, it's still early with Cronin. He's still kind of getting the team. We got him into the tournament. And then, you know, they were down to Michigan State. It was kind of basically about to lose. And then they went on a run. And then, like, they literally went on a, you know, game and then a game and a game and a game. Before you know it, I was like, oh, you know, like, <laughs> we in a final four. We in Gonzaga, you know. Um, it was such it was such an unbelievable run. Because how funny was that? And I know you guys thought about it because, the best player on that team was who? Johnny Juzang. Oh, man. See, that's – and look, last year, Kentucky was – it was a historically down year. You had to go – you had to you had to dig deep in the archives and, to, and research to find a year that was as bad as last year. You had to go, like, back, like, 95 years. You had to go back to the 1920s. And then 
you know, they go nine and sixteen. It doesn't work. A lot of it was, you know, poor point guard play, and it's, the chemistry wasn't good. You've been on with teams. You you know all about everything I'm talking about. You've been there and done it all. And then for us, as you know, collective fan base to sit there and watch Johnny Juzang lead. <laughs> when we had a team, we had a team every game. Every game, Travis. It was a a scoring drought for five, six, eight minutes, ten minutes. You can't even get a bucket. And there's the shooting. You you can't put the ball in the hole. And then we see him just getting buckets, getting buckets. And I was like, oh, <laughs> oh man, you Johnny Juzang was probably the most tweeted thing in the state of Kentucky during that run, man, because. <laughs> We just looking longingly at what we had. So, yeah. oh no, that's why. I mean, I remember him on the Kentucky team with obviously you know Maxi and 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 quickly and that team that went to the you know I would have probably went to the Final Four or minimum the Elite Eight. I felt because that team started clicking towards the end of the season, really good. Um, you know, you know, obviously COVID happened, but yeah. I think, you know, Johnny was a, was a good shooter, great shooter. Then, like, people didn't see his skills. But guess what? He went to UCLA, got his opportunity that like we talked right. about. Yeah. And, and, yeah, like I said, he had one of those runs that you, you, you don't see because, like, it's, it's one thing to be the guy to come out of nowhere every game or every other game and score 25. But to average 25 when people know, they know they got to stop you. Mm-hmm. And that's what made it so magical for him because he had one of the great runs I've, we've seen in UCLA history. Yeah. And they had one of the great, un, like, kind of unprecedented runs that they did in UCLA history because nobody thought they were Final Four type. Yeah. Nobody. You know, like, they had, you know, players leave because of stress and all this other stuff. You know, players get hurt. And then they went on that magical run, you know? Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Um, and that's... That's my Twitter profile pick. We're talking about Twitter, how you got to get on there. But I was covering the game for the website I wrote for, and I was just down there courtside sitting, and somebody snapped a picture, and there was it was just me beside Johnny Juzang. So I still got to use – that's my little Twitter profile pick, even though, you know, from a couple of years ago. But we – you know, even though it was, you know – some Kentucky fans want to be salty. He was going, we, you know, it was happy to see him get his opportunity because I think at Tennessee, he kind of, you, you saw Flash, he had a good game at Tennessee, um, and then you, he just put it up, put it all together. So overall, you, you couldn't help but be happy for him to see him get out there uh, and do his thing. He wanted to go back home he, from there, went back there and uh, got his chance to, to get some serious run and produce, you know, when he got that opportunity. So, uh, definitely, man. And now you flip to this year, what, they're 20 and five, uh, been pretty good all season. Is that, did I get that right? 20 and five. Something like uh, that. Yeah. They're like about 20 and five. They got like, you know, eight, nine games left, you know, something like that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And they yeah, went out. Yeah. yeah but no, they, they, he's one of the top guards in the country, if not the best, uh, you know, he's definitely up there. I felt like he was, um, you know, like he's a great, you know, great player. I don't know if he's a, you know, I think he's a late first, mm-hmm. late mid to mid to late first. I think kind of player. Yeah, because um, he's such a great. I mean, he reminds me. I mean, don't get me wrong. People are gonna say it's blasphemy, but a little bit of Clay Thompson. I'm not saying he is Clay Thompson, people, no. but he, you know, has a Clay Thompson kind of feel because he's like six five, can kind of handle and shoot it, can shoot a spot up, you know, so. I think sky's the limit for both teams this year, Kentucky and UCLA. I would love to have them two in a bracket immediately lead eight to go to the final four. We have to, have to definitely do another episode if that happens here in a couple of weeks. You know, we hey to- man, if if if, 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 if UCLA is in the same bracket in Arizona, we got to do another episode. Yeah, absolutely. Now here's what I got to ask you too: with with this year's UCLA team, who on the roster reminds you the most of yourself? I would probably say Jaime. Oh, okay. You know, Jaime. Jaime is like, you know, if you want to say undersized, mm-hmm. uh, but still can score inside. You know, he he does a little bit more than what I did in college because he shoots threes and things like that. Yeah. Uh, I didn't shoot threes in college. But, yeah, Jaime probably because he's an undersized guy, but he's tough. You know, he plays hard. He gives, you know, effort, you know, and, and, and uh, he's just a good player. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I, I definitely had to see who you thought was 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 giving you memories of Travis Reed out there. So cool. So <laughs> All right, <laughs> I got to ask you this too because you you mixed it up inside. You a lefty though, but you did your thing around the bucket and and you know wasn't afraid to mix it up and get in there. So I got to get your thoughts on Oscar Sheboy because he's you know his historic rebound numbers that we haven't seen in decades. What's your thoughts on? And he's six six nine. On a good day, not the tallest guy in the world either. No, I would say this. What he's doing is so unbelievable that we might not see it again for like another five, ten years. You know, because what he's done, he's a monster. And Kentucky don't get those kind of monsters, right? Um, As far as like that kind of player, where he's just a beast inside. Those guys go to West Virginia, you know? Bob Huggins get those very physical guys. He's probably uh, Oscar She was probably the most physical player that Kentucky's had in a minute. You know, I think, I mean, uh, funny thing is Reed Travis, how uh, funny is his name? Uh, <laughs> from a couple years ago, you know, kid Reed Travis. Everybody uh, here called him Travis Reed too. They were, they were getting mixed up. So he was. Yeah, that's the was funny like, thing, was, right? Yeah. Yeah. Because <laughs> Travis is a first name and Reed, yeah, yeah. And so, uh, you know, like he's probably the most physical player that you guys had in, since him, but he just in years. So I think, you know, to me, he's the national player of the year. I think, uh, you know, it's not even close. Don't get me wrong. People are doing great things. But, like, how many times you see a guy averages 15, 16 rebounds, 16, 15 points? Yeah. That doesn't happen a lot in days, you know, and nowadays. And so – I think, you know, his energy is endless, too, because he runs the floor like a gazelle. Like, he runs it, and he has his hand out, his left left hand out running. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't realize it, but he gets uh, the shooter, uh, Grady, he gets him so many open threes because he's running so hard, and people got, they automatically suck down to him. And Grady's open for a wide open three because they're sucking down to him because he's running so hard. Yeah. After the South Carolina game, Frank Martin in his post game press conference, he of course he was you know ticked off they just lost, but he he said that he said he said this guy's not even leaking out. He said this guy's hitting the glass, but still beating us down the court. He's and consistently <laughs> he said he's not getting run outs, he's not cherry picking, he's hitting the boards and still beating us down the court. You know, yeah, no, he he is he like I said he's. Like I said, if, if Ben Wallace was reincarnated, that's what Ben Wallace is. Is Oscar Sheway. If Ben Wallace could shoot a little bit, I think Oscar is a little bit more talented than Ben Wallace was. But let's just say he is Ben Wallace because he he works hard and he and like I said, he doesn't have a lot of moves or anything like that. But he just, you know, he is just a beast. Yeah, yeah, for sure. You know, mm-hmm. he is just a beast. I'm just like a W. I'd be like just pistol a double double in or you know pencil nine ten rebounds in yeah. and it's not like his team you know kentucky like leads the lead, leads the, the nation in rebounding or something like that mm-hmm. you know like and he got athletes with him you know he got uh the tall athletic guy i can't think of his name with his brother in the nba Top. Top, he got Toppin. Mm-hmm. you know he got uh you know like they got they got lance uh you know they got you know they got athletes on that team so yeah and i was i was on the uh was believe in Wizards podcast. They had me on because they're thinking that maybe you know Tata might fall to them in the lottery, and a lot of the Wizards fans hoping you know Kentucky gets Tata. So I was on there with uh, Matt Moderno host that, and I was that you know Oscar is is crazy. If he has fourteen rebounds in a game, his average goes down. That's that's what we that's where we at right now with him. <laughs> <laughs> fourteen bo- fourteen boards and your average goes your your average dips. <laughs> no, no, that's what I said with him. He's a, he's a, like, he's he's doing so well because Tuck, if you notice, Kentucky doesn't necessarily get those kind of players. They don't get the like the physical specimen guys. They get like an Anthony Davis's, mm-hmm. Car Anthony Towns, uh, you know, like uh, the guy from last year, you know, mm-hmm. Oliver. Yeah. yeah, they get those yeah. kind of guys, long, athletic, skinny guys. Willie Oscar, Stein. Willie Carly Stein. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Who was the guy that came in with him? Or the other big guy? Oh, they had Nerlens Noel was in there. Um, Nerlens Noel, but like on that same team, there was another center with Willie Carly Stein in them. Oh, uh, Willie, what's that now? 
Oh, Dakari Johnson. He was. There we go. There we go. Yeah, Dakari yeah. Johnson. Uh-huh. You know, like you, uh, Randall was another physical specimen, but uh, but a little bit undersized. But like I said, Oscar Shewe is just. Uh, like I said, he's a monster. And like I said, he, the offense, the lineup uh, that, that Kyler Perry put around him is perfect for him. Because guess what? You have, you know, you have a, a, a point guard who's fast and quick. They get the ball up out of his hands fast. You got a scoring point guard slash two guard in Ty Ty. You got a shooter, the best shooter in the, all the conference in, in Grady. And then you got, uh, you know, the old Wiley veteran on the team. <laughs> Uh, who's who can shoot also? So it's a spread out offense, mm-hmm. you know. And uh, and like I said, you got Obi Toppin off the bench. You got Lands off the bench. You got. Yeah. I, I think Kentucky has a way better bench than Kyler Perry must think because he doesn't play the other guys that much. <laughs> yeah, plays them like in the first half, and that's kind of it. Yeah, and you know, you so, know? to that point, but, uh, to that point, they're shorthanded, you know, with the backcourt out, but. Bryce Hopkins come in there last night and balled out. You know, he had, you know, 13 points. I like Bryce Hopkins. Yeah. He got game, man. Yeah. Uh-huh. And uh, Damian Collins, he's still real thin, but a couple weeks ago against Alabama, he came in there 10.6 boards in about 10 minutes. So he- no, so I think he's a special athlete. You know, he is spectacular athletically. You know, I don't know if he's going to try to go pro or not. I would hope not because I would hope that he comes back and, like, kind of works on his game. Yeah. Um, but I, I think that he would he would dominate next year. I think him and Lance would be a tremendous front court, you know, because they would bring so much energy. Yeah, yeah, you're right. You know, um, and like I said, I, I know obviously or maybe him and Obi Toppin probably because mm-hmm. I think Obi Toppin starts next year. Yeah, and he's his offensively. He's you can he you can just see him putting it together, uh, little by little. There's there's still some moments where he's open for a reason but you can see i mean he's he's you know hitting little turnaround jumpers he's hit a couple threes takes it to the rim you can see it all i, I say oh, it's just no. bubbling below the surface and he's fixing to put together and, it, and he's he's about to explode when it all clicks for oh him. no i think he's a lottery pick talent i think you know to me like he's whatever he is six nine six ten you know he can handle a little bit he can shoot it mm-hmm. uh, he can, obviously is a tremendous athlete uh, I think that uh, he, you know, he he is a lottery talent. Now, will he be a lottery pick? I don't know, but as far as talent wise, he is a lottery talent. He he's a top ten talent. Yeah, for sure. You know? Man, gotta ask you about your other podcast on the network and Athlete's Journey. We talked about the you believe in UCLA and Athlete's Journey. Tell us about what you're doing on that podcast. What can listeners get when when they tune into that one? Pretty much what they can get is like you, you have me just hosting and I'm asking you know, all kind of athletes, men, women, <coughs> former, current, uh, you know, NBA, WNBA. I just had on WNBA player uh, Chelsea uh, Perry and her trainer, uh, Nate uh, 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 Bowie. Um, you know, just talking about like, you know, their journeys and how and how, like, it's helping people. You know, I've had Charles Abandon on there, you know, former NBA player. I've had uh, from NBA players to, you know, uh, overseas players. I've had a bunch of players that, you know, and some that are coming out soon, coaches, and pretty much just, like, former athletes that people want to know, like, what happens to an athlete after the journey ends, right? And after the show is out, the show stops. And what... You know what I do is give people a, a, a shine into the, their their life. Uh, people, one of my athletes, have substance problems, substance abuse problems. So they, you know, they substance abuse, you know, alcohol, the drugs, or depression. You know, and it's because people don't know how we don't know how to uh, make that next journey to the next thing. Because I played basketball started when I was four, and I played. I retired when I was thirty three. I'm 29 years. Yeah. And uh, I had no, after basketball, when I retired, I had no idea what I was doing. Mm. I had no idea what I was going to be. No idea, like nothing. So it was a struggle, a big struggle for myself to figure out what was I doing? You know, what I'm going to do with my life. My family hated me at the time. 
I, you know, like they couldn't get along with me. I couldn't get along with myself. I hated myself. I hated mm. everything. I was mad at God. I was mad. At, I was just mad, you know? Mm. And for myself to kind of like learn how to, you know, finally get over that hump. And my friends, you know, I wasn't the only one to get over their humps. For future generations of people who have that struggle, you know, uh, or have that in any sport, it could be basketball, it could be baseball, it could be football, it could be soccer, it could be whatever. Take a listen to, to the show, An Athlete's Journey, because it might teach you something that you might learn from somebody else's journey to be like, oh, oh, they went through this? I went through that too. Right. And, you know, maybe I can figure out, okay, don't do this, do this. And that's what I do. And that's pretty much, you know, give people opportunity to tell their story and how they how everything goes and then what happens after. For me, it's always the big thing is what happens after. Right, right. And a lot of young athletes coming up can, can learn from what y'all went through. And you've been there and can give insights as to how to handle different situations. And, yeah, that's – I definitely got to check that out for sure, man. For sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one last thing, too, I got to ask you. Now, I'm not going to – I listened to uh, your episode with, with yourself and Sam, the latest episode of Believe in UCLA. Mm-hmm. Uh, y'all talking, of course, basketball. But y'all y'all flipped to football because y'all talking about the new defensive coordinator and all that coming in, and y'all are like, eh, kind of mad about that. Now that <laughs> That other school across town just hired a, a, a new coach, got him from Oklahoma. They got a lot of buzz over there. And, and now what what y'all think about what they got going on? Or is it y'all see anything happening? Y'all ain't worried about it? Or y'all like, oh, they really oh, no, about no, to no. do we're, something? No, no, no. As we're, as, as, as be honest, man, you know, I would say many men, like, we're worried. Okay. <laughs> Big worry. Big worry. Mm. Because you don't leave Oklahoma a top five program in the country for USC, unless you know it's about to, it's about to go down mm. here, mm. right? And like, he knew, he, the coach knew two things. One, he's going to the SEC, so he's just another team in the SEC. Preach, preach. You know what I'm saying? He's just another team in the SEC. Yes. Everybody's chasing Alabama and Georgia. Everybody. Yeah. yeah. No matter what you are, you're chasing Alabama and Georgia, period. No, you know, like, LSU, I mean, we'll see how Brian Kelly does. Yeah. But, like, you're chasing Alabama and Georgia. Texas A&M has come up. We'll see what the coach does. You know, Kentucky's actually come from out of nowhere to where they are now. Jeez. Um, we, we You proud, know, football, man. as far as, like, yeah, I was shocked. Two, okay, two, okay. A two ten win season in four you know, years so. for us, man. <laughs> the best they've been in, in my life. SEC? Yeah. That's what I'm saying, man. The SEC, man, it's not even, man, please. What out of all them teams? So he knew Texas and Oklahoma, they're just another team in SEC, period. Now, he knows as USC is a top five college brand, but guess what? The brand is low. So he can buy low, sell high. Now, if you would have came after Pete Carroll, <laughs> that's one thing, right? Yeah. He's coming after an interim coach. He's coming out to Clay Hilton. So, like, they were stinking for, like, two years, two, three years. So, if he wins 10 games this year, it's heaven for the SC. Mm-hmm. You're right. So, it don't even really matter. Like, he just, like, 10-2. and two. He can go 10-2 and two next year. And their schedule is weak enough to where, like, they can probably go 10-2. Uh-huh. Even 11-1, and one, you know? He'll be um, the and that, <laughs> He is the savior of the SC. You know what I'm saying? He could, I mean, I, I, like he's so young that he could be there for a minute. He could be there for five years and still be young enough to go to the NFL if he wanted to. Oh, wow, yeah, right. You're right. You know what I'm saying? So like, you know, like Nick Saban, seventy or almost seventy, whatever he is. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I think with SC, and if you notice, he's getting the talent. He is starting like SC is starting the talent. When they got Caleb Williams, I said, oh no, yeah. You know, because I was like, oh, they don't have a quarterback. They don't have a quarterback. Then they got Caleb within, you know, their best quarterback left. I'm like, why would he leave? Oh, <laughs> Caleb Williams is coming. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. oh, you know? You're right. You're right. 
And so, like, we, like, you know, as at UCLA, like, they 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 signed Chip Kelly to basically approve it uh, extension. He only signed a three-year extension. Mm. That's one recruiting class. Yeah. You know? So, like, if I'm, if I'm SC, I'm like, look, this coach ain't going to be there for, like, two more years. They ain't going to fire him. Yeah. Why would you want to go in that situation? Then right. you're going to end up coming to me anyway. Mm-hmm. You're right. Might as well come here now. I'm here. I'm stable. We back. Yo, man. Oh, you know, luckily, and, you know, luckily for them uh, that UCLA is just a better basketball program. Mm. <laughs> you right. But we talk about football, too. So we'll see what happens. But I'm, I'm, I'm big nervous. I'm yeah. super nervous about Lincoln Riley coming to, to, to SC. Yeah. I think he could turn it around, and I think they could turn it around quickly, like in the next, maybe next year. But the next two years, they might be real good, you know? That's true. That's true. Man, Travis, this has been a blast. I appreciate you taking the time to hop on here. And, man, we hit all the fun topics. Your journey, the Bruins this year, your interactions with Mr. Wooden, Mr. Alcindor, and Mr. Walton. Uh, if if it's Kentucky and UCLA in that bracket, like I said, we got to do this again. We already got to. Gotta, I'm with it, man. I'm, I, 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 I promise you, like, uh, you know, when, when they did it, was it like four years ago, three years ago, when Lonzo Ball uh, was there at UCLA and they played the Sweet 16 versus Kentucky when they had Bam Adebayo and and Malik Monk, you know? Fox, and what's yeah. name? And Fox went off for 40, whatever it was. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so, if yeah. We'd, if, we'd mean, been on, if we'd have been on the network then, we could have done it then. But we'll, you know, exactly, exactly, <laughs> man. So I'm with it, my friend. Just, you know, let me know whenever you want me to come back on. I, I, I'll definitely come back on the show. Absolutely, man. Y'all check Travis out. Believe in UCLA on Believe Podcast Network and Athlete's Journey. And y'all also go to aseablue.com because every episode of Believe in Kentucky, Jason Markham and everybody at Sea of Blue. They put the episodes up on their site too. So check it out here at believe.com or at a sea of blue. We definitely appreciate it. Travis, man, be safe. Have a good rest of your evening. And like I said, I can't thank you enough for, for hopping on here, man. This was a whole lot of fun. No, I appreciate it. If you guys ever want to follow me, uh, follow me at Travis W. Reed, R E E D, on Instagram and Travis W. Reed on Facebook as well. Will do. Will do. Y'all give Travis a follow. And this has been another episode of Believe in Kentucky. Record, I'm sorry, re- review, rate, subscribe, and all that good stuff. Give us a good five-star review and a comment. And we'll see everybody next week on Believe in Kentucky. Take care, y'all.